So it's pretty funny. <laughs> a lot of mankind's earliest documented problems have been all about us doing things that we know we shouldn't be doing. So great examples of this are Adam and Eve and Pandora's box. And despite explicit instruction not to do the one thing that would harm them, our protagonists found themselves doing them anyways. Now, we were like that back then, and we are like that now. Except now, there's a crucial difference. The fate of our planet is at stake, and we're on the clock to act accordingly. Of course, I'm talking about climate change. Now, the thing that's remained consistent over time is that there's been a certain disconnect between our beliefs and our behaviors. While we may intend to do something, have a certain belief in our mind that we should do something, a lot of the times this does not manifest itself in action. It just stays in our minds. And I know I'm guilty of this. I know taking 30-minute showers is a waste of water and bad for the environment, but I took one this morning. So, <laughs> so and even small reminders, and in my bathroom there is a plaque um, that's saying, oh, don't waste water, um, and that has helped me a little bit, but the change that those small reminders results in are small, they're minimal, and they're only short-term. They're not the kind of change that we need. So what kind of change do we need? I like to use the term sustained and systemic behavior change. What does that mean? It means that it's not privy to our whims. So just because we don't feel like doing something, uh, we don't feel, uh, I mean, taking a shower is just so comfortable. Just because we don't feel like doing something doesn't mean we're not going to do the right thing for the environment. It also means we're necessarily changing the system we're operating in. And so the environment around us makes it easier to make the decisions that are helpful for the natural environment. So how can we bring about this change? There are a couple approaches, and a lot of them don't work. A lot of them have been proposed to maybe kind of work. So one of them is an appeal to reason. I like to call this the Bill Nye approach. It considers we take facts and figures and throw them at you until we get them to change, because if people are informed, they'll make the right decisions, you know? <laughs> no. So, instead, instead, I, I, don't think it, I don't think it matters how many times I tell you we've contributed X amount of gigatons of carbon dioxide into the environment in the last year, or if I can point out a logical inconsistency in your argument using a reductio ad absurdum. You know, this doesn't change life itself. The kind of change that we need makes it so that the actions that we feel like doing to help the environment don't feel like actions, they just feel like life. Another appeal that doesn't work is an appeal to emotion, something I like to call the Al Gore approach. Now, a lot of you have probably seen the documentary An Inconvenient Truth, and it's popular for a reason. It evokes a particular emotional response in us. So it can be encapsulated with a video of a drowning polar bear. So imagine one swimming through the ice trying to find stable footing on a, on a sheet that, to just rest its paws on because it's been swimming for so long. But it doesn't, and the screen fades to black, and we're left thinking it died. Now, this, this elicits a pretty powerful emotion. A lot of you may be feeling this right now. But this emotion doesn't last. By the end of this talk, you all will not be feeling so sympathetic for the polar bear. In fact, you will be forgetting about it. So, and this is not something we can base sustained and systemic change on. So what can we base it on? Well, there's one approach uh, come up in part by a Nobel Prize winner in economics uh, just pa this past year, uh, Richard Thaler. And he gave it a name that none of you will like. It's called libertarian paternalism. <laughs> and, and so per, per, perhaps it is, as much as we don't like the sound of that, per, I can convince you that two seeming wrongs can make a right. So 
Let me break it down for you. Libertarian means it's freedom preserving. I'm not limiting the choices you're making in your day-to-day -day life. A, a libertarian policy simply is, it, it's not, um, for instance, limiting the amount of days that you can drive, saying, oh, only Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays for you. This limits our choice. It's not libertarian. The paternalism part comes in while you are able to make all the choices you want. We're rearranging those choices in a way where it's easier for you to make the decision that is best for you. Okay? So an example of a libertarian paternalistic policy is making use of a thing called default choice. So if I make something, you have a bunch of options to choose from, and one of them's the default choice, and then you have to go out of your way to select a different one. The default choice is going to be what the majority of people pick pretty much every time. So, or, or at least it increases it by a lot. And so think about if you're uh, shopping for, a, you're thinking about making a, getting an electricity plan. The default electricity plan the company provides you with is probably gonna be one, one you choose. Okay, so that's an example of libertarian paternalism, but some people think, some behavioral scientists think, we know enough about behavioral science and we know enough about what's good for you, what's good for the environment, that we can ditch the libertarian part, that we can limit the amount of choices you have, consisting of, uh, for instance, banning a certain kind of sunscreen that hurts the environment, or, uh, for instance, if the local government, perhaps here in Durham, uh, shrunk the size of the trash cans, it would result in less waste. Uh, think you have a small closet, you fill it. You have a big closet, you also fill it. It's that kind of thing. And so, but regardless of the approach that we take, the same players are in the game. And when we're thinking of specific policy, we have to consider who's actually making the decisions. So I like to break them up into three categories. First, there's the individual. Next, there's the government. And then finally, the corporation. Now this isn't an exhaustive list by any means, but uh, I feel for the sake of outline that we're just gonna stick with that. So they all have a certain amount of influence and they all have a certain amount of bureaucracy. They also have their own unique intention to action gap. I'll start with the individual. Individual has no bureaucracy. The, d the time it takes between an intention and then doing the action is quite small. But because there's no bureaucracy, there's no structure. Because there's no structure, the natural in, we go with our natural inclinations, and our natural inclinations are not as what's best for us, and is not what's best for the environment. So there needs to be a kind of structure, a bureaucracy for the individual. And the players that can create that are corporations and the government, which are also made up of individuals. But they're in a certain kind of bureaucracy, right? So let's consider the government. The government has a very high amount of bureaucracy. It takes a long time to get things done. But when it does get things done, it has power that can't be ignored. The problem is with climate change is that we have a lot of people in the government who believe in climate change and a lot of people in the government who don't. And because of this, because the intentions aren't aligned, they're conflicting, the action isn't produced. And so the question becomes, how do we get the people in the government to have aligned intentions about wanting to save the planet? Well, we need some kind of change. Change comes out of necessity, necessity comes out of crisis. But if we wait for crisis to come about with climate change, it's going to be too late. And so, recently, um, there, there's an example. And so, there was a school shooting in Parkland. And, you know, coming from South Florida, it, it uh, really, really impacts me. But we, we, we can use it as an example to see um, how, when some kind of crisis arises, that uh, the government can actually come together and hopefully make some kind of change, at least we're seeing evidence of that. But we can't wait up for that kind of change for the climate. But, so what can we do? I'm, I have one proposal for us, and it's to vote for people who do believe in climate change. So I hope with the government's kind of bureaucracy, if we have all the people in the room with the same goal in mind, 
they recognize that we are facing a crisis and don't have to wait for some tangible thing that they can come together and do something. But in the meantime, that doesn't look like that's gonna be getting done, so what are we left with? We're left with a corporation. The corporation has a certain amount of influence, and they have a certain amount of bureaucracy, and they're kind of in the middle with this Goldilocks zone. Their influence is pretty large. If they want, uh, think about the products you use in your day-to-day -day lives. They're not made by the government. And their bureaucracy is not that large either. If they want to get something done, they will get something done. Otherwise, they will go out of business. That's how corporations work. The problem is with their intention action gap, even though it's small, that their intentions are not in the right place. They're focused on economic incentives, not saving the planet. So the question becomes, how can we get governments to care about the planet? And I have another solution for you. So the, remember, your first solution is to vote for people who believe in climate change. That's for the government. Second solution for the corporations to get their intentions in order is to speak with your wallets to buy products, to create an incentive for the corporation, to create new products, to create the system that we need, the structure, the bureaucracy, us as individuals need in our day-to-day -day lives to make the right decisions for the environment. Unless we have this, I'm unsure of where our, the plan is going to go. I don't think it's going to be very good. But there is hope. If this structure arises, I believe that there is hope. And so I hope you will join me in the future in coming up with new ways we can influence the government, influence corporations to create the structure we all need. Thank you very much.